Cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for having us and for attending the panel. Um, this panel is called Take It Off Chain, um, Unlocking Innovation with Client Side Zero Knowledge Proofs. And just a bit of background on, on the panel. Um, we want to talk about this today because although ZK is a huge narrative in our industry currently and a huge source of activity, um, it's doing one very specific thing and one very narrow thing, which is essentially powering blockchain infrastructure. So, you know, ZK has been talk, talked about and built, and, and built on for things like ZK rollups and light clients and bridges. And those are great things. It's actually a great place to start with ZK. Um, but ZK doesn't equal blockchain. And there's tons of things that you can do with ZK that can happen off chain. And I think if you, like as an audience member, if you understand that and you understand what ZK is aside from the blockchain infrastructure use cases, it's going to be the most important thing you've understood since you first understood blockchain. So it's really a new superpower for the tech industry and for the world in general. Um, and you know, it's great for blockchain, but it can be used for other things as well. And it can augment blockchain. So that's why you know, hopefully our session today is useful to you. Um, and just a, a word about the structure of the session. Um, I'm going to ask each of the fellow panelists to introduce themselves briefly. And then I'm going to grab the mic back again. And I'm going to talk about how a ZK application um, and client-side ZK works at a very basic level. Because I think it's a new topic for a lot of people. Um, so I want to like, make sure we have a level set on this and make sure people realize we're not talking about roll-ups and like, clients and bridges. So I'm going to go through a basic example. Um, and then I'm going to hand back to the panelists and ask them to do a deeper dive into their projects and how they're using client-side ZK, because this is kind of where it's all starting to happen. So hopefully that'll be useful. Um, we'll try and leave a little bit of uh, time at the end for questions and, uh, and yeah, and wrap it up then. John, you want to kick off? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm John. I am the CEO of Veridice, and we provide security services. So. Uh, one of the main things that we do is we provide audits for blockchain applications, but one thing that we've been doing a lot of lately is auditing ZK circuits. And so I am here to talk a little bit about some of the uh, applications that we've helped uh, develop with O1JS, and then also uh, you know, report about some of the observations that we've made about ZK, both in infrastructure, but most notably about uh, ZK as it's integrated into blockchain applications. Right. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Padilla. I'm the CEO at Sneakerdoodle Labs. Sneakerdoodle is a decentralized uh, consumer data platform. We help brands get the best in class Web 2 and Web 3 data, defragment wallets. We help consumers own and control their data. And some of our applications right now are very much focused on decentralized ad networks. We have this out in Farcaster with Twitter, Telegram, and Discord happening in quick succession. But we've been working with O1 and the team there to develop ZK proofs for cookie deprecation, which really, you know, to Phil's point earlier, if we do this right, this means any type of Web2 discovery and search can use ZK proofs, can use this technology without people ever realizing they're leveraging the blockchain. That's really, really exciting. Hi, everyone. I'm Oliver Gale. I'm CEO of Panther Ventures. Uh, we're building a zero-knowledge uh, DeFi infrastructure, which allows essentially regulated institutions to execute transactions compliantly on-chain and also privately. And I'm Phil Kelly. Um, I lead business development at O1 Labs. Um, O1 is one of the pioneers in the ZK space. We've been going for about seven years, so we're, we're ages old in uh, Web3 and ZK terms. Um, we built the MENA blockchain, so that was the world's first recursive ZK-based L1. And you may think MENA's been a bit quiet for a couple of years. Um, that's because we've been working on this massive upgrade. And it's actually on the topic that we're talking about today. It's, and, and it's going to go live on Tuesday of next week. And that's a coincidence, by the way. We didn't know that when we booked this session. Um, so it's going to be the first generally programmable um, ZK platform um, that will work at the application layer. Um, okay. I'm going to try and uh, explain or make sure everybody understands application layer ZK at this point, which is kind of a dangerous thing to do in a live setting at a conference, but uh, let's try. But this is, uh, uh, this is a place to tune in. Actually, let me ask, how many people think they already understand client-side ZK or ZK for application usage? OK, 
That's, that's great. And that's, not, that's kind of what I would expect, because I think there's a lack of understanding in general in the world about client size ZK. So uh, good to know. All right. Let me um, try and explain this with a worked example. And let me ask you just to forget blockchain for a minute, because ZK doesn't, mean, doesn't equal blockchain. They're like cousins, but ZK doesn't mean blockchain. Think about ZK as tamper-proof computing, just tamper-proof computing. So let's think of an example where John writes an application. And it's an application to check my age. So he writes the application. He writes it in this tamper-proof coding, ZK. Um, he sends it to me. And I like, get it, and I run it on my, on my phone. Um, and then like, I open the app, and it says, OK, like, get your passport and read, use, the, use the reader to read like, the NFC chip in your passport. So I do that, and then I've sucked into my phone um, details about myself that are signed by the US government, so that, you know, they're highly trusted. Um, and that I've then got like, signed data on my date of birth. And then John's app takes my date of birth, it compares it to today's date, and it says, yep, he's over 18. Um, and it then generates a statement that I send to John. So I don't send, the, the data stops with me. I don't send my data anywhere. It stays on my phone, it's entirely mine. But I send John a statement saying I'm over 18. I also send John a statement from the app saying, this is a zero knowledge proof to show you that the application ran correctly. And then when he gets the statement and the proof, he just finally does this step where he checks that the proof itself is not forged. It's like the real proof from the original app. Um, that's called the verification step. And once he's got that, he knows that, like beyond any reasonable doubt, I've got a passport that shows I'm over 18. I really used that as the input. I didn't tamper with his coding. I really ran the code, and I didn't change the output. So it's this method of trust engineering um, and you know, the other way we know of trust engineering is with blockchains, right? But blockchains require you to um, have full transparency, and they require you to replicate data many times, so you know, across tens, hundreds, thousands of nodes. So ZK is a way of trust engineering, um, but it's done through the mathematical cryptography in the code, rather than through transparency and replication, which is the way blockchain does it. And so that's a super useful property. And so just for avoidance of doubt, I'm not saying like, don't use blockchains anymore. On the contrary, I'm just saying use off-chain ZK applications to complement blockchains and vice versa. Let me just um, round out here with a couple of other examples. OK, so what happens if instead of this use case where like, you know, John's a person and I'm a person and he sends me a, a program and I run it and I send him the result back, what if John was a blockchain? Um, so then. You know, he could run the verification, the, the blockchain could run the verification, and it could record the result immutably. Um, and then people in future could reference the blockchain and know that you know, my, my statement is true. They don't have to go through the whole process again. They've got a reusable statement of truth. They can compose it with other things, like they could take another statement I've made, like I don't live in California, and they could you know, use those proofs together. So that's one variant of the example. Another variant of the example, John could be a DeFi protocol. And he might want to do some complex pricing calculation. And if he did it on chain, it's going to be gas expensive, it's going to be compute expensive, you know, it'll have other drawbacks potentially that doing things on chain can have. So he could send it to me, I could run the calculation for him, send him the result and the proof that it's done correctly, and he can carry on with his smart contract work, but having offloaded you know, a bunch of compute and gas costs to me. Uh, all right, a couple of other quick examples, and I'll go on to the panel. Um, another example, I could be, so forget blockchain again, I could be a, a, an editor in a, a newsroom, and I could get a photograph from a photographer. And professional photographers often have digital chips in their cameras which sign the photograph, so you can prove authenticity of media. You know, and that, in, a, in its raw form, that's a way to try and avoid you know, deep fakes or no one getting deep fakes. So, you know, I've got a journalist or a photographer, he's taken a picture, it's signed. But you know, the reality is news outlets don't, don't publish raw form photographs. It's worth editing them for things like cropping and sharpness and color. And so those are, those are legitimate things to do. So I could take this signed photograph and I could run it through a ZK editing program. And then I could pass on to John as the publisher a photograph, a cropped photograph, edited photograph, with a statement that you know, all I did was edit it uh, by cropping and sharpness. You know, I didn't add images, I didn't take things out. Um, so I can help with authenticity of media. 
So there's a whole bunch of things you can do with off-chain ZK. Um, OK, hopefully that uh, helps, but I think will help to solidify the understanding by going through some real live use cases um, in the context of some cool projects. So let me hand over to, since I started off with an identity example, let me hand over to uh, JP um, just to talk a little bit more about Snickerdoodle and what it's doing and how it's using ZK in particular. So at Snickerdoodle, the team and my CTO, Todd Chapman, we set out to find a way to handle this massive issue of cookie deprecation in Web2. And we think that this is the future of where Web3 is going. It may not be the sexiest use case of ZK technology, but it has immense addressable market and a very, very large uh, footprint in terms of the number of people who would interact. And I think the goal of a lot of us here today is figuring out how to get mass adoption in the simplest interface possible. So from a technical perspective, you know, cookies in Web2 are a way to track data. A lot of companies use this to allow for personalization, to allow for discovery, to try to root the best likely outcome of what you want from a search to something that's going to yield a, a positive result for you. But this has been under, kind of under attack the last 18, 24 months. You read about this in the news, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, that cookie deprecation is happening that basically Google, which has the lion's share of this market, is moving to a world where they're going to get rid of this. Now this, if you're a big company, if you're Microsoft or Google, you have tons of first party data. But if you're a small, medium sized business, the lion's share of where people actually work, customer discovery, customer engagement is nearly impossible without the data brokering, the data targeting to connect an individual with a business. So, our use with O1 and the team here has been able to use the circuits to create a replacement where we can have the same effect of a web to web cookie, but it's a complete zero knowledge proof. And the neat thing here is you're getting the same level of data fidelity, but you're not revealing any personal identifying information. You're compliant with GDPR and other privacy regimes. And this creates a solution that, you know, we're already in talk with a lot of folks from a large Berkshire Hathaway subsidiary uh, to several large corporates uh, in aviation and, and in traditional tech who want to look at this not even from a Web3 perspective. And that's, that's the crazy thing, Phil, is like we're here at Consensus, which is very Web3-centric, but the folks that are most interested, I think, in some of this ZK cookie replacement are large enterprises who are very concerned about dealing with privacy regimes in Europe and dealing with how do I run my business in a world where, where Google has made it nearly impossible for me to do my job. Yeah, very cool. As I said earlier, there's, there's also then a ways in which you can bring blockchains back into it by having things then verified and persisting on blockchains. So it's kind of like where Web 2 and Web 3 will start to really convert. It's up. very much like a Trojan horse, but mm -hmm. you know we're not going to sack Troy. We're going to build it up. Yeah. Um, is this a way in which, I mean, looking at all the hacks that have happened, uh, you know, lists as long as your arms, but the data hacks, including the least one with Ticketmaster, is this something that can help with reducing the availability of honeypots and the cost of cybersecurity? I mean, I think that's the reality. I think the, the future is decentralized, and to this point, most large Web2 enterprises have a completely centralized tech stack where you have something in the cloud. That's, that's a great honeypot for a firm or a hacker to try to take control of a system. The core of the ZK tech, and you marry that with the other things we've built at Snickerdoodle, allows for edge computing. And so we're able to have a decentralized data lake that's queryable at scale with low latency because of some of these ZK proofs. And that basically means that everybody has portable data. Data storage is data. We call them cookie vaults, but really just data wallets. Yeah. And so that wouldn't be possible without the ZK circuits we've built with O1. And you know, we're super excited about where this can go yeah. to a world where we actually truly have self-sovereign data. Yeah, cool. I, I like your model because you know, as part of the industry, uh, you know, everybody's message that you know, privacy is normal resonates with me. But the problem is there's no commercial model behind it. It won't necessarily move very quickly. So you know, you're like a great marriage between privacy preservation and a commercial engine behind it. So that's, that's great. 
Um, can I move on to asking John um, about your experience with ZK applications? So I know you did some work with us just as a kind of POC to um, explore proof of liabilities for exchanges and, or anything else you want to talk about, of course. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, in addition to all of my other hobbies that I apparently have, every once in a while we uh, take a break from auditing and we kind of develop proof of concepts. And so one of the proof of concepts that we developed with ONJS is kind of a, a proof of liability system. So at a high level, what a proof of liabilities is, is when you interact with an exchange, you hope that you can get uh, this thing called a proof of solvency. So a proof of solvency proves that, you know, both this is the amount of funds that I owe to users and this is the amount of funds that I have in my reserves, right? So it consists of those two, two pieces. And so what we're going to be talking about is how does one uh, work with a proof of liabilities. So in that case, when a user comes to you and they say, I want to deposit X amount of funds, they can actually prove that um, you recognize their liability and it's in some publicly recognizable form so that if at some point um, like you want to extract your funds, they can't say, oh, uh, we never received from funds from you and uh, you know, we don't owe you any money. And so that's kind of what uh, this proof of liabilities is. So we worked with ONJS in order to develop an application that would allow uh, people to create this kind of proof of liabilities with CK circuits. And the reason why we did that is because, uh, one, it provides better um, privacy guarantees. So now people can kind of privately interact with the blockchain. You don't have to worry about revealing personal information about them, including their account information. But also on top of that, it kind of helps with some other uh, stuff that Phil had talked about, like off-chain compute. So now, rather than having to uh, check in everyone's liabilities every time an interaction happens, which would cause an enormous amount of fees if put on the blockchain, uh, they can instead uh, perform aggregations off-chain. And they can prove that they've performed this aggregation correctly, and they can uh, bulk check in all of the modifications that happened at once. Cool. And you can, like, that use case has become kind of relatively well known in the Web, in, web 3 industry because of the blow ups with the exchanges. Um, right. And I think you know, Vitalik and some other people wrote a paper on this um, a little while back. So it was kind of seen as a way to help ensure honesty um, about statements by exchanges of their total liabilities and total assets and make sure they really were solvent. But you could see this being generalized you know, way beyond that. I mean, you could have any, any business in any industry be able to make statements about their books and records and have those statements. I mean, right now, if, you know, a, if a company makes statements about its books and records, they're generally trusted either by reputation or by the fact that they've been recently audited, like in the annual audit or an internal auditor. But you can have a much higher level of confidence if a company was running its uh, books in some kind of ZK database and could actually prove to people, you know, hey, this is, what, this is what's in my database. Of course, right. you know, it never stops them to keeping two, two sets of books, but you know, don't let progress get in the or, or perfection get in the way of progress. Uh, that could be a pretty useful thing to do. You could imagine it being useful for supply chain use cases, for example, where you know, if you're asking people to participate in some kind of tender, they need to prove to you that they've actually got the stock uh, for you to award them the deal. Um, so yeah, I kind of like that use case because it's got a lot of real world applications. And it's easy to create a proof of liabilities when you're working with on-chain assets, but like Phil said, yeah. there are applications to off-chain assets as well, because that's where proof of liabilities becomes more difficult. Yeah. Because then you have to prove that you transferred money, there's all of this uh, information which is kind of behind closed doors and is hard to actually validate. And so uh, in order to actually prove that you paid someone, it, it takes a certain, um, or quite a bit of you know, trust, but also, uh, if you're trying to prove that you paid someone, it, it takes a certain amount of information that people typically don't want to reveal, like actual transactions that they executed or credit card statements or something like that. And so this is a way to uh, you know, perform similar interactions, but in a more trustless way. Um, and then like a very quick diversion before we get to Ollie. John, uh, do, do ZK applications need to be audited? <laughs> oh, uh, as an auditor. That's a great question. <laughs> yes, ZK applications do indeed need to be audited. So um, we have audited quite a few ZK applications, um, including applications involved in infrastructure, like, uh, you know, we've audited ZK VMs and stuff like that, but also ZK applications like uh, Panther. <laughs> 
But um, one thing that we found is the number of cri high and critical bugs that we found in ZK applications is more significant than what you find in DeFi protocols, and that's purely because it's um, more difficult for developers to identify bugs in their programs because now uh, testing is no longer sufficient to identify any bug that uh, someone has in their circuit. Cool. Excellent. And then, Oli, can I turn the floor over to you uh, sure. to talk about Panther? Yeah, so uh, I think two of the primary use cases we have for uh, use of zero knowledge on the client side would be self-verification, or ZK compliance. So in order to access Panther, uh, shielded pools, which are these, um, to reiterate, uh, essentially a compliant mixer run by a regulated financial institution to protect their on-chain fingerprint, their alpha, their transaction flows, et cetera. Um, so in order to access this uh, sensitive environment, which has received a lot of um, uh, uh, notoriety in the press in recent times, it's quite politically charged, one has to go through a compliance process. And so we enable any sort of arbitrary off-chain compliance system to be connected by the financial institution and run so they can connect their existing compliance systems or they can use, uh, we've done an integration with Purify, which is an on-chain compliance aggregator, so they can use an out-of-the-box on-chain solution or connect their own system, run the computation, and provide a proof to the smart contracts on-chain that the verification has been completed to the standard of the financial services provider. And so that in and of itself provides a, a mechanism through which finance on the whole can achieve huge efficiencies by not having to replicate uh, compliance uh, information across tens of thousands of vendors uh, and counterparties, which increases cybersecurity pro uh, costs. One can submit a proof that verification has been done and the counterparty um, under the correct regulatory regime can accept that. And an example of uh, such a regime would be the PSD2 uh, open banking standard in the UK as an example where banks do not require payment service providers to re-KYC uh, their users so long as they have a license, they can rely on the KYC of the counterparty provided they can access the data on request. And so layer one ZK compliance is this ability to prove and verify without having to custody data whilst also having secondary access to that data in the event that is required, such as a suspicious activity reporting or some other regulatory requirement. So that would be uh, sort of entering the Panther ecosystem. We use client-side ZK. And then secondarily, now the user is within the ecosystem. They're uh, doing private peer-to-peer -peer transactions or swapping assets with third-party DeFi protocols. Um, or internally swapping assets amongst themselves, uh, there needs to be some proof of their balance that the transactions first are legitimate and that if they wish to exit the ecosystem, that they own what they um, claim to own. And so uh, client-side ZK proof of ownership is generated, has been generated, and that's submitted once again to the protocol. And in a zero knowledge way, the protocol can verify that indeed the user is entitled to the assets that they wish to um, take out of the environment, and so they can then do that. So, uh, and, and again, this is when we look at the migration of TradFi to DeFi uh, or just the extension of DeFi slash on chain finance. Um, we have these primary problems that the industry is dealing with now, um, user acquisition, liquidity, uh, smart contract execution costs. These are sort of first order problems. If nobody uses it, why would one want to use it? Uh, and, and so having reached some sort of critical mass and having greater regulatory clarity, now the conversation as we've experienced it has turned to, well, how do we compliantly migrate on chain and as part of that conversation then this large second order problem of how do I uh, confidentially execute transactions on chain it's not in our interest or the interest of our customers or even 
permissible under data privacy acts for us to be sharing customer data in this sort of unfettered access way mm -hmm. where every transaction is replicated thousands of times across uh, these publicly um, visible databases. So, you know, in that context, uh, zero knowledge proofs are, uh, you know, computationally they save costs and they're uh, sort of moving finance forward and also leveling the playing field because in some sense, DeFi is inferior to TradFi when it comes to things like your privacy, privacy of your uh, transactional data. It's, it's cool to hear about some of the flexibility you're starting to get on KYC. Um, and, uh, but it, it, that, the arrangements you're talking about kind of essentially involve escrowing information. Um, so yep. that if there is an issue, then like the person who didn't do KYC because they relied on a, a proof is able to then access it retroactively. Yeah, that's, I, I think, it, in the regulatory landscape that I, I've looked at anywhere, that's a prerequisite. And, and yeah. you know, oftentimes uh, a regulated entity will say, look, I, I understand that you can have some sort of MPC driven data vault with an escrow and a law firm or some third party that can help us to access the data. And that's all well and good, but our regulator is not prepared for that today. We need access to the data full stop. Yep. I don't want to have some escrow mediation process. Um, and, and then on the other hand, there are some regulators who think the ideas are interesting. Uh, but I think it, it's, we're, there's still some bridging of that divide to get to the point where yeah. you don't have guaranteed access to the underlying data. And so yeah. it's not really private finance, it's confidential finance. And that's the type of finance we enjoy today. Cool. Um, we've got, I think, two minutes left. Um, yeah, any questions? Yeah. Okay. So, so the question, John, you might be able to best answer this, but I mean, the, the question is, um, what about the performance requirements? So, you know, ZK School proving things on, on, on the application side, you know, on my phone or on a, on a laptop are kind of revolutionary, but, you know, what about the performance requirements in particular for RAM? Um, John, I'll, I'll let you jump in there. Yeah, so there's constantly being work in academia uh, right now about, or that is attempting to improve the performance of ZK circuits. Um, so that's one thing is it's always worth looking to see uh, what new innovations have come out because they are trying to reduce the um, impact on the client side. And then you can also do things like uh, it is also possible to compose different uh, types of uh, proving systems in order to actually get something that you can prove on chain. So for example, some people will prove something with Plunk and then prove it with uh, Groth. Uh, 16 in order to like improve the performance to onboard onto the blockchain. Other things that are worth noting are you mentioned specifically like uh, zk VMs and stuff like that, and they can be quite expensive to run. Uh, and that's where writing uh, circuits yourself can be useful because then you don't have the overhead of having to prove the correct execution of the VM and the the zk circuit, and that can drastically reduce the amount of or computational resources that you need in your application. So our, our, the toolkit we've been majoring on so far allows you to build a TypeScript and run a proof in the browser. Um, but you know, there, there's a role for ZKVMs, absolutely, because there are some massive computational challenges that you might want to prove, and that's where ZKVM would be useful. We're just out of time. Thanks very much for listening. We're um, all available to talk further about this topic afterwards. So enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for watching this.